if it wasn't just a, a JPEG in your in your profile picture? What if we could take this character and, and we can make them come to life? And so like the simple way I like to put the story verse is that we, we bring NFTs to life. Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. I'm Carly Riley. Today on the show, I have Justin Waldron. Justin, at 19 years old, co-founded Zynga, which is the company that went on to make Farmville and the earliest like Facebook poker games and Mafia Wars, I believe, was one of their games. Anyways, he was uh, uh, involved in the very early days of social gaming in some ways invented the prototype for it. And so much of it is a precursor to what has come and what has played out in Web3. And what's been fun for me in preparing for this conversation and preparing for this interview, looking back and learning more about the history of Zynga and the the history of early social gaming and, and just having all of these like retrospective aha moments, if that makes sense. It's been fun to realize how all of these things that I now take for granted as obvious were at one point themselves innovative. Uh, You know, we talk in this episode about in-app purchases or buying poker chips like in a game on Facebook and and how that was new at the time that that somebody would do that in that way. And um and, and, and I don't know, just that feeling so revelatory and then so relevant for where we are today with NFTs. So we get into all of that. We talk about his history. But the the real reason I had Justin on is for a new project that he's launched called Storyverse. And Justin approached me, uh, I guess a couple weeks ago now, to tell me about what he was thinking with this project. And it excited me from the very beginning. I don't know what will happen with this. I don't know if it'll succeed, if it'll fail, but I can say that the thinking here is is interesting and the thinking feels right in the sense that it sparks my imagination and it feels fresh. And he's he's getting at things this space, in my opinion, really needs and starting to present solutions for how we can get them. Solving this problem of all these communities say they're going to have a game and are community led, but how do we get to this end state of having a game? I don't know. There's, there's a lot that I think um, he starts to fill in the gaps for. So without revealing too much, because I want you to listen to this episode, that's what we get into here. And that's really why I wanted to have him on the show. I will say, I think I'm getting like 10 plots of story verse land uh, as like an advisor to the project. I have no idea what those are even worth or will be worth. I, I think very little, certainly at the beginning. I am in no way having Justin on because I'm getting these plots of land. Uh, Justin asked if I could help advise the project, and I was sent an email saying that in exchange I'll be getting these, these this bit of land. I do want to just say that, uh, but I just promise you that that zero impacted my decision to have him on or, or to show this project. I, I just think it's interesting, and I, I think it's – I hope it sparks your imagination as much as it did mine in terms of what the future could look like and where this space could go. So with all of that preamble, we are going to hear a word from our sponsors and then on to the interview with Justin Waldron. Everyone is talking about the metaverse these days, and we're all still trying to figure out what it actually is because everyone is looking for how to get exposure to it. That is why a metaverse index fund is so important because in such a young market, an index can give you broad exposure to all the various players who are building out all these digital worlds that will ultimately become the metaverse. And that's why you should check out the metaverse index from the index co-op. The metaverse index gives you simple, easy, and safe one-click exposure to the emerging open metaverse trend. The MVI index contains some of the biggest metaverse projects out there, including Axie Infinity, Decentraland, Alluvium, and more. So join thousands of holders who have already trusted nearly $50 million to the MVI index. And if you buy $500 of MVI on the Dharma app, you can receive $50 worth of ETH on the Polygon network. There's a link in the show notes for you to click so you can get started on your journey into the metaverse. Polygon is Ethereum's largest and most vibrant scaling solution to date. With millions of monthly users and all of the biggest DeFi apps, the Polygon ecosystem has turned into a blossoming metropolis of DeFi activity. Transactions on Polygon are quick and cheap, allowing users the freedom to achieve their DeFi goals, all while being economically anchored to Ethereum. 
But Polygon isn't just the proof of stake sidechain. The Polygon team is building a suite of scaling solutions, including Polygon Hermes, Maiden, Nightfall, and Zero, all with different design choices in order to be optimized for all possible crypto use cases. If you're a developer who wants to build on the Polygon ecosystem, go to the link in the show notes to check out their fantastic documentation. And if you're a user who just wants to experience fast and cheap DeFi, you can bridge over your ETH or other tokens and start playing around with any of the thousands of applications that are available on Polygon. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Overpriced JPEGs. I am so incredibly excited for today's episode. On the show with me today, we have Justin Waldron. He was the co-founder of Zynga, which if you know it, you probably know it for the game Farmville that took over your Facebook feed back in the, I don't know, 10 years ago. Uh, and now the co-founder of Playco and a very exciting Web3 project called Storyverse, which is really why we're here. But I'm, I'm so excited for this conversation, Justin, because I think I, I want to get into the, the history and what you built with Zynga because you can trace with like a straight line some of the innovations and, and some of what you were responsible for pioneering with Zynga to the world today of NFTs and Web3. So we'll we'll talk about that history and, and sort of how you contributed to where we are, I think, in, in the work you've done. Um, and we'll dive into that. But just so excited to have you here and, and to be chatting. Yeah, thanks. I'm really excited to, to chat about it. Cool. Well, let's start off. I mean, give folks a little bit of your story and, and your background and and uh, and we'll dive into to Zynga and how that came together. Sure. So um, I think for me, I, I grew up playing games like a, a lot of other people. Um, and, and from a young age, I really I wanted to make them, too. I wanted to change things about the games I was I was playing. And unfortunately, um, you know, I, I started looking into what it would take to go and and make my own game on the PlayStation or something like this. And you needed a development kit and they were tens of thousands of dollars and Sony only sold them to official developers. And I was a, I was a 12 year old boy looking to, uh, to make my <laughs> own games and I, and I couldn't. So the only option I was left with was to really go and like figure out how to modify these, these games and, um, and work on these sort of like cheat code devices where, where I would like go and dig into the game and see if I could change little things about it. And so from the, this very young age, I was always thinking like, well, um, if I don't have permission, how do I take what I have and 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 make something out of it that I want it to be? Um, and and that's really where it, like it got it got started for me. And obviously, you know, the world is has of development has become a lot more accessible since then. But um, for me, it was it was about sharing these 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 things that I thought were interesting with other people. Um, and so naturally, like I, I became very interested in social networks. I was lucky to have been. Um, you know, growing up when things like MySpace were becoming very popular. And again, it was about um, finding ways to make my profile the coolest profile out of all my friends' profiles and, and finding ways mm -hmm. to edit that. And, um, and then ending up on Facebook when it was just opening up to university, right, as I was uh, coming into to university. And what was really interesting about that is shortly after they launched uh, the platform, um, and I sort of like immediately thought like, wow, all the things that I've been doing sort of... Um, without permission for the last 10 years, I can now do with permission. Um, and so instead of, you know, hacking AOL and, and PlayStation games and, and MySpace pages where there, there are no APIs, Facebook has come out and said, we have APIs, you can build whatever you want on this platform. And so for immediately for me, it was like this really weird moment where I was like, oh, they want me to do that. Um, and, <laughs> and so I got very excited and I built something the day they, they put out the platform. Um, and it was a simple way to sort of connect to you with your friends um, who are also had a Nintendo Wii and to play games together. And, um, after releasing that project, um, I, I got in touch with, uh, Mark Pincus, the, the founding CEO of Zynga. Um, and he was like, well, why don't we build some Facebook stuff together? And, you know, from there I went and I worked on and built our, our Zynga poker game. And, you know, obviously it became uh, a much larger company with a lot more games after that. Um, but for me, like what was always fascinating was like this realization that there's, there could be something great and there's a way to make it better. And, um, like, how do I, how do I get involved with that? And so for Facebook, it was like, all my friends are here. How do I, how do I bring them together so we can play a game? Um, and, and, and that's just been like probably the, the constant theme of the things that have been interesting to me, um, as I've, I've worked through, uh, my career more recently, um, you know, what I noticed was that on mobile, um, these, these things weren't really happening. Um, they, 
in some way with the way the app store is is constructed it was it was harder to actually uh find a way to play games with your friends um because these apps are sort of their own silos uh it's hard to encourage your friend to go download the same game and so i started thinking about with my my co-founders at playco how do we how do we go and solve this problem on mobile and um we realize you know there's a lot there's a lot to it there's technology that has to be built there are partnerships that have to be made um and and so we just set out to say like we should go build a company around this because it's it's not an easy problem to solve but we think we have a team to do it awesome and we'll talk about playco and and sort of more in depth in the way you're you're innovating there or thinking about these problems you're looking to solve staying on zynga for for just a minute I'd love to hear you talk about a couple of the big innovations you think Zynga really brought us. I have some in my mind, but I, I want to ask you first and then I may I may offer up some of my own as I've been doing research on on what you all did. Um, it's a good question. So I, before before Zynga, um, of course, people were playing games on the web um, and, and people were, developers were using products like Flash or Shockwave to, to make interesting games on the web. I think uh, what hadn't happened was people really hadn't figured out a business model for games on the web. And so you were seeing like hobbyists and, and sort of um, coders who, who, who could have been very talented, um, but they weren't able to scale their ideas because they couldn't figure out how to make money from these games on the web. And so we had websites like addictinggames.com or these places that had, you know, mm. where, where game creators could make a little bit of ad revenue, but it was never enough to sustain a team. It was, it was only like enough to sustain a person or two who were just passionate about what they were building. Um, and, and I think what we figured out at Zynga was like in this model where, where people could play games with their friends, the, the distribution um, costs could go low enough that you could get a lot of people to play. And if, and if some of them paid for the game, they could fund the development of the game for everybody. Um, and, and now I think that's that's kind of like a, a widespread idea. This is now called the freemium game model. But um, at the time, it was it was very uh, fringe and, and like people didn't think it would scale or, or exist in any any large group of people. So what we were able to do was was bring these games out like Farmville or Mafia Wars or Yoville, which was one of the largest virtual worlds 10 years ago. Um, and basically uh, show people there, there was a path where we thought it was better con for consumers, where um, if you look at like the history of games, the, the cost of, of like a minute of entertainment just keeps going down. Um, and actually like this, it, this model, what it allows people to do is play a game for free, see if they like it. And if they like it, they can choose to spend money or not. Um, and, and actually mm -hmm. we felt like that's a much more fair model to consumers. Um, and, and I think consumers voted with their feet, like ultimately, um, even though a lot of game developers had disagreements about whether or not that model was was the best one uh, for years, consumers actually seem to agree with like they, they want to play the game, they want it to prove its value, and they want to spend in a way that they feel like they're, they know the value they're, they're getting. Um, and so I think that that idea over the last you know 10 years has really um, become a huge part of the, the game industry. So what you're describing was this innovation around distribution, and it sounds like it's that combination of identifying an opportunity and luck in the sense that Facebook and, and social media platforms created a way for mass distribution in a way that really hadn't been possible for games or the kind of games you're talking about in the past. And then you added on top of this, this social distribution layer in, in that friends would spam their friends, for lack of a better term, to get them onto the game. And that was sort of free distribution you had directly through people's social networks. And so that was really new. And, and tell me, you can correct me if, if any part of that was wrong. But then there's this flip side that I think you also innovated in, and it's the combination of the two that, that made you so successful, which is the monetization side. Uh, and you said in, a, in another interview that you felt like you were able to create this kind of awesome flywheel, which is that you mastered mastered, I suppose, I think that's fair, the, the distribution side of this in a new way. But then you also created this new monetization side, which was in-game purchases. And in, in the poker example, you had folks paying real fiat and real money for chips in the game. And my understanding was that was really new at the time too. Can you speak to that side of things, the monetization? And, and correct me if, if, if I'm wrong about that being so new? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So I mean, um, well, I think it's just about like thinking about something from first principles and, and trying to figure out like 
what what's the best way to make everyone happy here? Um, and and I think what we we're we we're doing is instead of we didn't know how to build games. We didn't come from the game industry. Like I said, um, it, it wasn't it wasn't an easy industry to break into. And and the people that were a part of the initial team at Zingo, we were really focused on like the web and and what it meant to to go build something that could um, like in social networking and and to connect people. And so we approached it from that angle. And for us, it was like, well, these people want to play games with their friends. It's more fun to play games with their friends. Um, what do they want? And 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 how do these these web services work? Like people don't expect to pay some for something upfront in most web services. So what is the internet native business model was like what we were trying to solve in our head. And instead of just kind of like taking the existing business model and, and forcing it into, you know, onto the web, we were instead asking ourselves like, well, what do people pay for on the web? How do they, how do they discover things on the web? And then we we're trying to figure out what that meant for, for games. And it was like sort of an experimental process that happened over, over years. Um, but to answer your question about poker, we, we didn't we didn't know if people would do it. It was an experiment. I mean, we we one day we decided to ship this idea of selling chips, and um, and we, we had no idea what to expect. But we knew that people wanted chips because they were always uh, asking us for more chips. And you know, of course, <laughs> they were they were getting some of these chips by inviting their friends, and and there were all different things they could do. And so we said, well, why aren't we just also selling them? Um, and we started selling them and it, it, it immediately um, it started working and it was like it felt like we found this secret um, that other people hadn't realized yet. And we had kind of a few years to go and run with it. And we were like, OK, well, if if chips works, like why not, you know, this game and this game and this game. And, and so um, it, it was a really it was a really fun time. And I'll just say, like, it was it was so early in the sense that, you know, even to sell these chips on the Internet, now you have payment processors like Stripe and everything else. Um, but we had to build like a 25 person team internally that just processed oh credit gosh. cards and prevented fraud and everything. And so, um, you know, it, it was like the, the earliest days here. Uh, there were the only sites on the Internet that were processing credit card payments at the time were, um, were you know, uh, businesses that were that were not like the, the the most upstanding businesses in the world. And so They're shady there businesses, was, there, <laughs> yeah, there, there wasn't there wasn't infrastructure built for like you know, a modern web two company. We had to go build it ourselves. That's incredible. So, yeah, and early. and what year are we talking about? What what years are you talking yeah. about here? That was 2007 um, when we, we launched selling wow. uh, poker chips and, and, and everything else. And then um, we had a similar experience on iOS, actually, where we were one of the earliest developers on, on iOS. And we brought over one of our famous games, Mafia Wars, to iOS. Um, this is before Farmville. And there was no way to sell uh, in-game currency on Apple's platform, actually. And when we told them, um, that we wanted to sell in game currency, they were like, why, why would you do that? And so we had to find a way, <laughs> we had to find a way to sell virtual currency. And so we, we, they had the idea of paid apps and free apps. That's, that's all that existed on their platform. And so what we had to do is have, uh, you know, mafia wars, $10, mafia wars, $5, mafia wars, $2 and mafia wars free. And, um, you would, the way that you would buy more tokens in the game was to buy many versions of the app in different dollar denominations and you'd have them all on your home screen and and all of that money would flow into the same account that you logged into and you could open up any of these and play the same game but obviously um if there's one way to get apple to change its mind it's it's to make something that's not beautiful so um yeah. you know <laughs> redundant <laughs> and inefficient <laughs> yeah. yeah once once we did that um and if people had their home screen full of mafia wars icons they were like okay and you know iaps can shortly after so it's always been about like, you know, how do we how do we give people that experience what they want within the current constraints? We're used to sort of um, not waiting for uh, for other people to go and figure it out. Well, and it's having, I guess it's the first principles point you're making, but it's having a real pulse on what people want and what consumers you know gravitate towards. It, it seems like a, a through line, and we'll get to it with Playco and, and Storyverse and things. Um, but it feels like a through line in in the work that you do. I was also laughing at a, a story I heard you tell on I think another podcast about you, you talk about this like it was this secret that you were selling all these chips, you know, in your Facebook game essentially, and you guys were making like a billion plus dollars, and Facebook had no idea. <laughs> like they just did not realize all this money that was flowing through their platform. And it, it's just amazing to me that this was really not that long ago in the scheme of things and just to think how much we've evolved uh, in the space. So this feels like such an important point, this point about in-app purchases or you know, buying chips in the game, because 
the expectation from folks in my world is that these will all become NFTs and that, yeah, it's pretty cool to own something in an app or in a game, but how much cooler is it if you also own it outside of that game and it can have value? I'm wondering, are you are you naturally then also very bullish on that concept or do you have hesitations or how do you think about NFTs being everything that we exchange in games at some point? Yeah, my, my approach here is just to assume like a greater level of intelligence in, in the people that consume products than most people I think do. Um, and so mm -hmm. with, with freemium for us, it was like, well, people, people understand the people who play the games understand that freemium is a better value that they're not being asked for money up front and that they play something. And if they don't like it, they move on to the next game. And if they like it, then they spend money. And that's fundamentally more fair and in, in a very easy to understand way. And I, and I actually think that um, NFTs have the same sort of value where um, not only do you get to potentially try these games before, before you pay, depending on the way the, the economy works, you, you also um, stand to potentially get some of the money back after you're done playing. So there's, there's an argument to be made that um, these games can be more fair um, than, than freemium games. And this is going to depend on the economies and, and where, where everyone takes this. But um, that's the future that I think consumers are going to be more excited about. The world is full of choice, uh, especially in games. People do it uh, not just for a living, but just out of passion. So it, it's such a competitive space. There's so much great content out there. And I think um, striking that balance of like, making something that feels fundamentally more fair to people is, is a good thing. And I think NFTs are a tool uh, that, that can definitely make that happen. And I, I see a lot of the same parallels when it comes to like the more traditional industry folks and the way they feel about, about NFTs. And it, it sounds a lot like what happened with, with, uh, with Zynga. Like we basically, we had this, mm -hmm. this growing, fast growing, um, set of people who are so passionate about about the way that we were doing things and we had the traditional industry saying like this is crazy like you're not selling them anything like you're not are, real these games are images. <laughs> these, are, these aren't real games the game design doesn't make sense the the, the model is like it's a ripoff like can you believe there's someone who's spending a thousand dollars in a month um and and i grew up like reading these video game magazines trying to figure out which game to buy and spending fifty dollars that I, I probably mowed a bunch of lawns for or something, right? And um, and and showing up, and then like, it wasn't as good as the review said, and I had no recourse. You know what I mean? And that felt that felt much worse to me. Um, and and so um, I thought like, if someone's spending a thousand dollars, if they keep spending more money, this idea of whales, people likened it to like casinos or something. But um, they're fundamentally like these people it was a choice they were making and like after each time they put more money into the game they're saying i enjoy the value that i'm getting out of this game and they have a choice to, to and i know the value i'm point. getting because i'm playing yes. it i know what the exchange is yes. i'm not being asked to put money up front and then hope that yep. it lives up to my expectations <laughs> that, that's so that's Farmville... exactly right well, and so i think nfts will potentially offer the same thing right which is or in, in the next evolution of it if um if people design the economies that way where um, you, you opt in and not only can you, um, put as much value into the game as you feel like it's, it's giving you back. Um, but also if you decide to leave the game at some point, there may be a way to like, to cash out and sort of give it to the next person. I, I, I played a lot of magic, the gathering growing up. And when I was, when I was done with the, the you know, the, the card game, I, I sold off my collection someday and it, it felt like, you know, it's, it's, it's going to somebody else who wants it now. And I think like, that feels like quite a natural concept actually to me when you abstract it. So it, it just, um, I think it's more fair and it's, it's like closer to the way things work in the real world. You know, when you give up a hobby, you, you, you sort of sell your, you sell off the things that you, you put in or the, the time you put in the, the, the objects that came out of it. It feels like a very natural concept to people. So to me, it's, it's less important, like how people feel it compares to their existing paradigm. It's more important, like, for the people who actually go and experience it, what do they think, right? Um, and how do we make sure they're having a good time and they actually like like the way that it works? I like that comparison to hobbies IRL and that, you know, depending on the hobby, you have assets at the end of your interest with that hobby to, to kind of sell off and this being similar. Farmville is a game that got a lot of crap for not being a, a real game in the eyes of, of the gaming community. And for those who aren't familiar, uh, you know, it's, it's a very simple game and you basically would 
plant plots of vegetables and build your farm out and you would click things to plant and sow the field or whatever. And you had to come back on at consistent time bases to make sure you kept sort of towing your farm or I'm using all the wrong terms here, but you get the point. It was very simple and very basic. And it feels like one of the reasons it got as big as it did I'd call it, despite being so simple, because people found it really soothing and it felt like an escape. And I, I think uh, Marcus Pincus, the CEO at the time, talked about how that was intentional and they, I thought, they thought it was something they could get non-traditional gamers into, more women, older people who, who just found it really nice and, and like an escape to go back to their farm and, and, and do the thing. I'm curious, one of the, the criticisms I, I hear of play to earn is that there will be this or that there is this psychological shift that happens when the thing you're doing also has the potential to earn you money. And it it ceases to be an escape. Even if it's something that is inherently fun, you're no longer optimizing for the fun. You, you can't help but to optimize for wanting to make money. What do you make of that criticism? Would Farmville have actually been less big had these been NFTs that could have made the money? Or would it have been 10x bigger? Like, how, how do you think of that based on what you've yeah. seen in terms of why people play games? That's a great question. I, there's a lot of um, actual like academic research into this on in, intrinsic versus mm. extrinsic motivation. Um, and, and game designers spend a lot of time thinking about it. And so uh, what's been fun for me is just like, as spending more time in Web3, just trying to combine the way like economists model these things versus the way like psychologists would look at it. And I think game design comes a lot from the sort of psychology side, but obviously in the markets, psychology is very important too. And, and there's some sort of um, like mixing of the disciplines that probably has to happen here to, to figure out how to design the right uh, systems. But the, the standard thinking is that if you, if you apply extrinsic rewards on something that people actually feel good about doing, that if you do it long enough, um, you can actually replace those good feelings that they get from, from doing the thing that they actually enjoyed, which is actually usually not seen as a good thing. Um, and and in, in my experience, like there's pure, more intrinsic motivation in people that can be more powerful. Um, and we see this like with in, in just in, in real life where um, people who are purpose driven in, in their work um, or in, in anything that they spend a lot of effort doing, um, they go and they generally do like bigger and more interesting things and they're more motivated. And, and then like, it's sort of important to, to make a living and to be paid by, um, for what you're doing. And it's like a huge consideration for everybody. Um, but what was really motivating people on, on Farmville was like, they, they wanted to express themselves and, and we had to find a way to sort of mm -hmm. like give them the breadcrumbs to, to do it, um, in a way where it didn't feel like a lot of work. And so the internet is this thing where anyone can make anything and anyone can show, show it to the world, but starting from a blank canvas is, is super intimidating. Like, why aren't we all out there, you know, making a song every day or, or, or painting a picture, or editing a video? Um, it, it's, it, seems, it seems daunting, right? Um, and uh, the trick with Farmville was like, oh, just plant a seed, you know? It, it was like this sort of five second ask, oh, but you got to come back and, and you got to tend to it. And then before you know it, like you had this farm and, and people were making their farms into, the farm was a canvas. It was a way of like showing who you are. But instead of saying like, okay, you have this big canvas, what are you going to do with it? You did it in such small steps um, that by the time you played the game for 10 or 20 hours, you look at your farm and you're very proud of it. And it did look different depending on who built it. But you never made a conscious decision to say, I'm going to spend 10 hours making something that I'm really proud of. We just convinced you to do it for 10 seconds um, mm -hmm. and then kept you going enough that by the time it was done, you were like, I have to show everybody this. This is my my cool thing that I've, I've made. And so... Um, like I have this, this like really, really foundational belief in, in human creativity. And I think this is like part of why I'm so fascinated by what's going on with NFTs right now, where like the more you lower the, the bar, like everybody is, is creative. Like you can see it in children. Like we all start growing up, drawing pictures and, and somewhere along the way, like, you know, there, there's some larger mental hurdle that stops us from doing that. And, um, being able to create like a, a, a tool, whether it's a game or some other form of tool that just makes it easier and, and helps people get to putting pen to paper is is like a very big opportunity. And so like that was definitely um, a big part of, of why Farm, Farmville succeeded. And, and I guess what I would say is like, this is whether or not money adds to that. Um, I think it does. I mean, I think people should be rewarded for their work. 
I think where that they where they get paid in, in the system, it matters because you, you don't want people to to feel like um, that the, the creation itself is no longer meaningful to them. Um, it, and, and so like it, it's it's just this system of incentives that you have to think through where like um, I actually think that motivation to create is so powerful and so human that, you know, you want you want people to be rewarded for it, but you don't want it to be the point, if that makes sense. Yeah. And and so much of this, I think, sets us up for where we'll go with story verse in terms of lowering, lowering the barrier to entry to expressing yourself. But even that, you know, Farmville being a precursor to so much that has come after what you're talking about with the farms being a way to express yourself, put another way, to socially signal, which is so much of what this space is about. And I mean that actually in a positive way, like it's going to survive, in my opinion, because it's just foundational to who humans are, to who humans are, that we we want to socially signal and, and tell people who we are. What I hear you saying in, in that is like, it, it makes me bullish on the idea that you'll have games where you have some folks putting money into the system like people did with poker games and then you'll have some people who you know, have, have be- gotten so serious about that game they are earning money into it or earning money out of it or you know they are playing to earn and you have others who are playing to play and even potentially putting money in there and that you you might have those sort of hybrid models um in addition to to maybe some other things um I want to get into to play co a little bit, and you, you mentioned earlier that part of the thinking with play co is how to solve this problem of of people being able to play games with each other more easily. But but maybe give the the flyover of, of sort of what play co is and and the problems you're you're looking to solve with it. Yeah, so um, at play co we we put together a team of people who have been trying to solve this problem of of how do I how do I um, build content that can live within the platforms people already spend their time so that we can very easily in that context let them play together um, and our basic thinking on this is that everyone wants to play games with their friends um, and and if you make games that fit in their life and, and fit in the spaces they're already spending time with their friends um, then they will they will play games with their friends and I, I think we we had proven like that sort of base thesis at my last company at Zynga um, but in a weird way, like even though technology has progressed a lot and we're more connected than we ever have been, um, that sort of went missing. And I think that's due to mm. just dynamics around the way that software is distributed on, on mobile. And so um, what we wanted to do was to figure out like how to solve that problem from a technology perspective, because really what we're talking about doing is putting games back in the browser where they can load instantly. And we're not sending people to the app store and, and they have to load within Um, the social spaces that people already spend their time and without asking too much of them in the way of like friction and and sort of um, getting started. And, uh, you know, the the technology that we built the foundations of Zynga on with Flash, Steve Jobs killed it. Um, He he literally (laughs) banned it from the phones. And and like that is why that is part of the reason um, that this didn't happen on mobile. It was a technology um, decision and and a policy decision Mm -hmm. from Apple that ha- we're still feeling uh, the effects of. And HTML5 um, at that time was supposed to be the, the sort of ultimate way of, of um, solving this problem, but it was just too early because like HTML5 never had to fill that void. Um, you know, Flash was was building rich applications and games on the, on the internet and it did it better than anything that um, the, the open web standards could do at that time. And so when when that transition happened, it was, you know, 10 plus years ago at this point, um, people were saying, well, HTML5 will be the thing that replaces it. And then everybody tried to go and build content with HTML5. And it very quickly became apparent that that actually it wasn't ready um, and, it, and it wasn't the, the replacement. And so a lot of people became uh, disappointed and, you know, people started shifting more and more to native development because it was what was necessary to go and build things on mobile, which was growing very quickly. Um, but we, we lost the, that ability to distribute content in a way where like we weren't bound by any particular store and this, the power of a link, like, and the way the internet works and what makes it something like to me the, the, the open web is, is a lot like blockchain. And when you think about composability, like I, I love the metaphor of, of like AOL versus um, the open internet and, you know, AOL had keywords um, and, and everybody would, would use AOL uh, back in the dial up days and, 
instead of going to HTTPS, you know, Oprah.com, you would just go to AOL keyword Oprah. Um, and, and it was so much easier than typing in a URL. And so people would say like, why would anyone go like mess with all these, you know, HTTP semicolon uh, slash slash stuff. That's very confusing. No one understands what that is. Um, but I think what happened was like AOL was building its own little private ecosystem um, that could grow in value linearly. But the open web, meanwhile, was building this, this, uh, this system where all the nodes were linked to each other and its value just grew exponentially. And at some point, like the, the closed web piece. was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so it grew geometrically. And, and so I think that the, what we're seeing here is like a similar thing um, playing out in blockchain and for all of the growth we've seen in mobile. Um, and, and all the interesting things that have come from it, it's, it be, the, because it's not an open system, like we're not seeing that type of growth. We, we've seen a huge amount of growth in users and, um, and payments have gotten so much better. And so like the business growth has been explosive. Um, but how much better could it be if, if every single thing, every building block that any developer built, other developers could build on top of it. And, and so I feel like um, that's why I love like the term Web3. Because it, it, it encapsulates that idea that like actually the web um, is is built that way, um, and it is like a natural sort of evolution of the web um, to go that that direction. And so for us at Playco, like you look at the the people involved at our at our, at our company, it's people who have been innovating on like building high quality content on the web for over a decade. Um, we have people who built the the largest um, open source game engines in the world on our team. So we, we have Pixie.js, which is the largest HTML5 game engine. Um, and we're very focused on helping people get their Web3 projects um, on, on board on Pixie. Um, it's got 16 million projects worldwide. It's, it's, it's got a top 200 GitHub project. Um, it's an absolutely huge game engine. Um, and we've got people like uh, Michael Carter, my co-founder, who uh, is one of the inventor of the WebSockets protocol. So um, like literally the, the thing that makes live communication happen on the internet and is also used as a backbone as part of Ethereum. Um, he's one of the in inventors of it. So we have like a really technical team because we like to start from first principles and, and look at um, the technology behind something and then like try to connect the dots about like, how do we make, to, to my earlier point, how do we make everybody get something more interesting and better out of uh, the, the building blocks that are here? And um, especially we're excited about like, how do we then take that and let other people also um, build from it? And so I think um, what we realize at Playco is that like actually like Web3 is, is super uh, aligned with, with like what we've been working on. Um, and, and for my own personal interests, like you were mentioning earlier, um, I, it never seemed like a strange idea to me that, that you could sell NFTs. And so I've been lucky to, to have uh, been working with and advising a bunch of companies that are pretty early in this space. So um, I met the CryptoKitties team early on, and I've been advising them since before it was Dapper Labs. It was Axum Zen and the Mutable team I've been advising before. They were Mutable. They were Fuel Games, and they had um, Gods Unchained. And I, I've been advising Decentraland when it was just a white paper. Um, and I, and I, and I, there was a lot about the space that I didn't like you know, during the ICO boom. Um, but, mm. but I, I couldn't help but be fascinated by this, these people that I was, I was meeting um, and the things they were building when I, I just felt like, you know, the possibilities here um, and these teams that are really doing things that are, that are interesting and real, like it, it just, it sucked me in. And so for the last sort of, you know, four years, um, I, I've been just thinking like, wow, at some point when we, we feel like we can have something to contribute to this space. You know, I can't wait to, to actually do that. Well, here we are. And I think this is a that's a good lead in for call it the highlight of this episode, which is Storyverse, which by the time this this episode comes out, people will have already uh, this will have been announced on, on Twitter and people will be able to start to to really understand what this is. But let's dive in because you are now in the Web3 world and and launching something very cool in Web3. And I, I would love for you to explain what Storyverse is and we'll, we'll talk about everything that I think is, is coming with it. Yeah, so um, the Storyverse is is for us like the recognition that, um, that the art and the communities that are being created in Web3 
are like a huge turning point of, of people being able to build bottoms up brands. Um, and when we look at these, these characters that are coming out of the sort of PFP universe of, of NFTs, um, we're just amazed. I mean, we're, we're in the, the business now for uh, almost two decades of, of like creating characters and games that people fall in love with. And, and when we look at the top projects, like it, we know that this is um, the quality that's there. It, it's in many ways, like even more impressive um, than what you would see in, in like the best mobile games or anywhere else. And so that really um, got us thinking like, well, what are, what are we great at? And like, how can we, how can we contribute to this ecosystem in a way where um, we can kind of take different group skill sets and, and make something that's much bigger than um, each person or each group acting individually. And for us, um, we're experts in game engines and we're experts in distribution. You know, we, we, on our, on Playco games, we've, we've had hundreds of millions of players, uh, player games. And, um, what we saw and got very excited about was when these NFTs started to permeate and, and become part of social networks, we thought, wow, like that's, that's what we do. Um, and, and what if we can make it more rich? Like, what if it wasn't just a, a JPEG? In your in your profile picture, what if we could take this character, and and we can make them um, come to life? And so, like the simple way I like to put the storyverse is that we we bring NFTs to life, and we we bring them to life by pulling them into a, a story that you can tell with these characters where they're animated, um, and and it's the act of creation. Back to this this lesson from Farmville is as simple as being able to type out a dialogue. Anyone who can have a chat with a friend on iMessage can create like a very simple dialogue between um, these different characters. And we have some of the best artists in the world producing amazing characters. Um, and then all these people that are passionate about these communities um, who wanna find more ways to contribute and, and create um, that can now like hopefully combine their energy and and create new forms of, of content. Um, and And so, we we announced the project uh, last week, and we're we're really excited about just basically um, developing this project with the overall community. Because for us, like we we really want to build something uh, with the community that uh, people feel like brings NFTs to to a new place, which is um, really starts capitalizing on the storytelling that everyone's been so excited about. How do we how do we build a platform um, together? where we can actually have storytelling within these communities and individually that then can be shared on social media to people to make NFTs an even bigger phenomenon than, than they've become over the last year. So at its simplest version, tell me if this is a, is a, is a fair description. You all have built tooling that's underpinned really by a game engine that allows NFT holders to easily create their own stories of varying lengths with their NFT characters, avatars, et cetera. Is that the, the most basic level what this is? Yeah, that, that's right. And um, we're excited about it because these the people that own these NFTs, they, they're passionate about them, right? And, um, and we think that uh, if, if they have a tool like the Storyverse, a, a lot of them would love to uh, go and write like an individual story about who is my character, um, what is their personality, and like what interactions that they have, and and share that. And maybe it ends up in their Twitter bio, um, and and they want it to be like this sort of permanent uh, bio of who they are and the character that represents them on Twitter, or or maybe they just want to create a meme. And, and have a hot take on some Twitter thread and like they're, they're using their character as sort of a, their public persona to deliver these, these messages or, um, and, and also like we want to support community creation at, at like the higher levels where people want to collaborate and, and go work on like, what is the official canon for, for our community in the sense that um, we all agree, like this is the main storyline of the universe. And so we're trying to solve the coordination problem of, of helping people build the story for a broader sort of universe, as well as like just letting people take the things they own and do something interesting and, and new with it. Um, so for us, it's been like, how do, you, how do you balance the community aspect with the sort of individual ownership piece and try to find a way to make everybody excited about this? 
Let's dive into the, the canon piece of this because I think where the empowerment of the individual to create and to unleash their curiosity, where that meets the uh, community component of this, as I understand it, is I think really exciting. So can you get into how the the canon side of this works and and ink rewards and, and talk a little bit about that tie-in? Yeah. So, so the way that it works is, um, like I mentioned before, like it, it, at a basic level, anyone can create what they like with what they own. And it was really important to us that, that people who, who don't own something can't create with it. And there's not only, um, legal reasons for that, but we also just want to be true to the, like the ethos of, of NFTs, which is you can do what you want with what you own. Um, and, and you can't go and create content with the characters you don't own and you don't have the rights for. Um, and then we wanted to take this content that you create and, and say, what is the easiest way for people to collaborate, like sort of as a group without blocking each other? And so this idea of official canon is um, if people are creating these stories and they're part of a community, if I, if I have my own uh, PFP community that I'm creating a story for and as an individual. I'm creating a story for my me bit, for example. Right. We can yeah, use that as the a, hypothetical. Yeah. It's there not you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so if you're creating a story for your me bit, you may be doing a meme or a hot take, or you may like have like a much more elaborate story about your me bit in the me bits universe. Everyone in, in the discord can um, very easily see, or other people can see on, on the story verse um, viewers that will be in, living in different places in these communities um, that this story has been created and other people can then, if they are part of me bits and they own a me bit, um, they get to actually vote on whether or not this story that has me bits in it becomes part of the me bits canon. Um, and so what this does is allows for bottoms up creation, but then some form of, of consensus where like the group and the people who are involved with the project are the ones who get to vote on, on what should become part of uh, the official canon. And we see official canon as like something that's basically dynamic. So not only is it based on the group um, voting on, on a particular story as I, I think this should be canon or other people voting it shouldn't be, um, it, it's also something that can change over time. So like if something no longer is relevant to the community, they can, they can go back and, and vote something out of official canon and they can evolve the story as their, their thinking changes. Um, but we like the idea of, of rewarding the people who are writing the stories by these votes coming back to them um, in the form of uh, this currency this game currency, Inc. Um, and we like that um, it rewards people for, for creating, but it allows for a bottoms-up creation where there's no particular gatekeeper, but um, ultimately leaves the power in the, the hands of the community to decide what they want to represent themselves as a whole. And this upvoting, there's sort of an upvoting, downvoting Reddit style, right, process there. And... I don't know what you will have announced at this point or if you can say anything concrete, uh, but, you know, there's there's thoughts of these stories that get voted into canon could live on the websites or, I don't know, within the discords or in various places of those communities themselves. And then it'll still evolve to your point. Sometimes maybe the, the story changes, but it's it's also in these places where these communities are gathering and they can build on each other and, and um, be inspired by what others are, are kind of doing on that front. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's exactly right. So um, I think to some extent, we want to um, partner with with communities that are interested to figure out, like, what do you want to do with with your official canon? Right. And so um, some communities we've talked to, they want to put it on a special page on, on their website. So they may have like a new page of their website where they're showing the official canon. And the cool thing about that is like the official canon can be um, dynamic, like as I mentioned. And so for a community member to go and be able to get their story on the official website for the project that they're so passionate about is, is really cool. Um, and we think there might even be ways to tie that back into um, other places on the web because this is web-based. Again, like this content can live um, anywhere. And so it's not just the official community website where official canon might live. We may be able to wrap that into um, like, for example, an app um, in the app store where like the the content is dynamically being pulled in and out. And if you think about it this way, it's like now suddenly um, anybody in the community could be contributing a piece that ends up in like the official app um, for, for that community, which is, I think, really cool. Um, and, 
and it could be in, in other places like where, where instant games are served on some of these social networks or like the possibility is endless. The, the thing we're excited about is that because it's web-based, it's like this building block that can be shared wherever it's relevant. Um, and, and so what we, we want to do is be able to like package up these official canon um, in a way that the communities want to distribute it and, and have it live wherever they think is useful uh, for them. Um, from our can part, you... like we have we have partnerships with, with um, from the, the Playco side of, of the business with like a lot of a lot of those social networks. So we could probably find ways um, to to get this content like living inside of it in some pretty novel ways. Axie Infinity is a game universe filled with cute, fascinating little creatures called Axies that players can collect as pets. Players aim to battle, breed, collect, raise, and build kingdoms for their Axies. There are and will be many varied gaming experiences for Axies, many of them having players compete with each other using complex strategies and tactics to attain top rankings or be rewarded with coveted resources. Others will have them complete quests, defeat bosses, and unlock in-depth storylines. There are countless unique axes that players can collect with varying body parts and experiences. The Axie universe is a player-owned economy where the players can truly own, buy, sell, and trade the resources they earn in the game through skilled gameplay and contributions to the ecosystem. It's a digital nation where people come together globally with their axes to play, earn, and live. Join the Axie revolution at axieinfinity.com slash bankless. Unstoppable Domains is the number one provider of NFT domains. With domains ending in .crypto, .x, or .nft, Unstoppable Domains lets you replace your long, complex wallet address with a human-readable address. Using Unstoppable, you can verify the ownership over your NFTs, log into Web3 apps, and join tens of thousands of people using them as their Twitter usernames. With Unstoppable Domains, you can have all of your crypto addresses registered to one single domain. So it doesn't matter where crypto payments are coming from or where they're going. By registering all of your crypto addresses to your Unstoppable Domain, all of that is taken care of in the back end. Better yet, with Unstoppable Domains, you don't have to worry about gas costs or renewal fees because you own it. Buy your domain and you can show it off as your new Twitter username. So you can get your name for as low as $5 at unstoppabledomains.com. So a couple things when when you were first telling me about this when we were on a, a call that that stood out to me where I, like m memes just like the next evolution of memes, right? Like it's it's memes now a little bit more advanced, you know, animated and with my own characters and if, if they're sort of living natively in the social apps where I'm already you know, imbibing my meme content, like that just felt like an, an obvious thing that I, I, I think people will enjoy. And I, I know there's a, a world in which this is sort of linear content where you can just kind of click through and see one story after another. And if you're a part of a community that a story uh, where a character is in that story, you can then upvote or downvote. I, I wondered if you could if you can drop any of the communities y'all are, are partnered with, I don't know what will what will have been announced by the time this podcast airs. But are there uh, any communities you can share that you're working with? Um, yeah, I, I hope by the time we uh, we air this, we'll have announced uh, at least a couple of them. We we've we've got a, b a bunch of them that we've been working with for for a while now. Um, one of the ones I'm I'm excited about just because I know that there were recently a, a guest on 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 your. Uh, uh, podcast is is a team. Um, we're very excited about about doing more with with them, and um, ultimately, like the way that we we view partnering with the community itself and, and the leaders of the community is is how do we help um, them in, in the near term, like imagine like what what is the full extent of the way that you can use this to create uh, a story that sort of officially represents um, this community, and um, and how do they. Um, how can we help them do that faster? So uh, with with or some of these other projects we're working with, we're, we're um, helping them onboard onto our tools um, and, and, and also even in many cases, like brainstorming with them about um, the stories that they have and, and how you might adapt these stories to the type of format that, that we, um, we've been uh, building. And um, I'm just really excited to be working with like a team like that. I think the IP is, is super cool. Um, and, and I think like when I look at it, um, just based on what I've seen from, from you know, the rest of games and, and broader media, like this is a brand with the right, the right tools and, and the right content and way of experiencing the content that could be really, really huge. And so um, 
I, I'm excited by this idea that like, just like PFPs in profile pictures for these with these NFTs have exposed many more people to crypto than the people who actually have wallets. I think that this mm -hmm. is an opportunity um, to get the people who are in Web3 and excited about it already creating content that um, can get even more people excited and experiencing what Web3 is without necessarily getting their wallet yet. Um, and so I think about it a little bit like the, the freemium model um, back for games, which is I think for a lot of these people, um, explaining the value of Web3, uh, it, it can happen when they start playing these games and they start asking themselves, like, I keep seeing these characters, these awesome cat characters, like, who are they from? What company made this? And, um, and then they start realizing that like multiple people on the internet are posting these, these story games with these cat characters. And they start to notice that they're responding to memes in real time. And this doesn't seem like there's some big game company behind this because it's, it's too dynamic and it's too community driven. It's, um, it, it feels like, it feels like the way the internet works. Um, and they start to notice that like someone must be, this must be a community of people controlling these things. How do I control one? And they'll go down slowly, get pulled into like, oh, okay, these people own this and they're creating content with things they own. And, and like, I, if I own one, I can create content like that. Um, this is like a really a longer on-ramp to sort of web three than I think most people are imagining. Um, but, but I think it's, it's the one we'll that take we'll take all the on-ramps we can get. Let's embrace <laughs> them all, <Yeah>. baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I want to sell I, more I, JPEGs, man. <laughs> yeah. What, what I like about it is it communicates the utility without telling them about the utility. Um, and, and, and basically like they will discover the utility by using, um, this, this thing. And so you don't need to tell them, look, they're valuable because of this. By the time that they're thinking about like they, there's a process of discovery that will happen for some of those people where like it'll be very, very clear to them um, why why they should go and participate in the ecosystem, because it's it, it's something it's what drew them in, in the first place. And so I think a lot of people get this social signaling, um, but they, they would like to to do it in ways that feel more um, authentic. You know, there's a lot of criticism potentially or like, oh, someone's using such and such pr project for their profile picture. What does that mean? And in some communities, it's it's totally fine. Um, and in other communities, people say like, oh, man, you're being too flashy or something like this. Right. Um, and I think giving people like alternative ways to use what they own, that where the goal is not just to say, I own this thing, but it's it's more complex, allows them to like have a way to potentially if they want to show off, do it in a way that's like a little bit less obvious and more socially acceptable, um, but also just like give them a way to to justify owning this thing from in more and more ways. Um, and so I actually think like this idea, it, it's it's about how do we make it obvious what digital ownership actually is, is at the, is at the heart of, of what the story verse is, which is you own something digitally, um, that doesn't just mean using it as an avatar in a metaverse. It also means that you can use it in these other ways that the, the projects have, have designated in their, in their license agreements. Like they, they want you to create these types of work, right? And so what's exciting about this is like, it demonstrates that. And so instead of people scratching their head and saying like, well, what does it really mean to be able to use um, one of these characters and like that I own? What does this, it mean to own a board ape? Yes. It'll show them that that's, that's what we're hoping will happen. So, you know, I love how you're thinking about licensing and, and some of the ways, I guess you'd say you're, you're kind of innovating in terms of making it clearer to people what these different licensing agreements that different projects have really mean. We're going to dive into that, but I want to, I want to, um, highlight a couple things. So, as you're talking about this new kind of an on-ramp for folks, I think one of the things you were starting to get to or allude to is that Storyverse is fundamentally built on top of a game engine. So while the simplest iteration of it is creating stories, my understanding is you envision a world where this evolves to people actually being able to build fuller scale games with their characters atop the game engine. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, 
you know, the longer term. Am I seeing you get scared? Like, oh God, we have not done that yet. And (laughs) I'm not promising that to everyone. Is that the look in your eyes that I'm uh, picking up on? (laughs) Well, I mean, look, we we do, Pixie.js is the largest HTML5 gaming engine in the world. And um, for us, HTML5 and Web3 go hand in hand. Um, So we would love to find a way to take those hundreds of thousands of developers and and let them um, help join forces with all this amazing, these, these teams is creating great IP and, and building the Web3 side to go build um, game experiences with each other. But there are some things that are missing, right? Um, and I think the Storyverse could be, could be one way to start to fill in some of these missing pieces. Uh, we have to solve the problem of like, how do you get these, these assets into a game engine and they're rigged up and they're animated um, in a way that everybody's excited about that represents their artistic vision um, and, and also respects their, their license agreement and also um, is a way the community is behind. And then um, we may be able to take it from there. Like, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves in the sense that like, I don't think we're capable mm-hmm. of it. We, <laughs> we are capable of it, but, but we have to go and make this work. And then I, and then I think that um, we can work with the community on like, hey, the natural next step here is, is story games are great. Um, and we can add more and more functionality to story games where we start to blur the line between what is an interactive story and what is a game. Um, so I think there's a lot we can do there. But also in the long run, we're very excited about how do we expand this to just games in general and, and, and make it even broader. Um, so definitely it's, it's something we're thinking about. What excites me about all this and, and why I, I maybe am getting ahead of us as well is because it feels like something that's so needed in this space, there are so many amazing art projects and PFP projects that ultimately promise a game or are promising a story, like are promising things that they don't actually have the talent on their team, as far as you can see, to, to really pull off. And this feels like a beautiful tool to, to plug the community in <laughs> and to fill that gap. And I think that's exciting. I'm curious with the communities you're working with, you mentioned... So I, I feel safe saying that. And if it hasn't been announced by the time this episode comes out, we'll, we'll bleep it out. And I'm sorry to all the listeners who are dealing, hearing a bleep if that's the case. Um, but what is the biggest piece of feedback you are getting in these conversations or, or a couple big pieces of feedback and, and what they're most excited about? Yeah, by the way, like um, I don't want to suggest that, <laughs> that this is an idea that we sort of just came up with in isolation by studying everything and taking a bunch of of notes on what's on the internet. Like we, we had hundreds of conversations with uh, the people inside these communities and collectors and, and the people running these communities. And um, through those conversations, like we figured out what we think um, is most helpful to people. Like we, we just kind of went around listening to, to all these projects and what they were excited about and what they were good at and what they were having challenges with. And that's, that's basically the shape of, of what we came up with came from all these conversations. And, um, for them, like, I can't really speak for the communities and they're all so different because they, they're all, they're basically, you know, going at this with their own strategies in terms of what they think is important. And, and some of them are leaning more into the technology and some of them are, are leaning more into the Hollywood relationships. And it, you're seeing all these different strategies um, play out. For us, like the one thing that is, is common is, is community. Um, like all of these projects are based on, on a very strong community when they're succeeding. And um, I think those people are capable of, of a lot more um, than, than what the, they, they can do right now and because they just don't have the tools. And so for us, like, if, if we think bottoms up brand building is the future, it needs a new set of tools. The future needs a new set of tools. Um, and, and there are tools that are great for, for game development. You know, there's, there's Unity and there's these, these other tools, but they're not built for communities. They're built for companies. Um, and they're not built for Web3. And so we're trying to, to go and ask ourselves from the grounds up, like first principle approach, what would these communities want in, in a game development tool? Um, and what would they want in, in the near term in a storytelling tool? Um, and then work with them to make sure we're, we're building uh, what they're excited about, basically. So I like the dynamism of this, which is I could see this playing out in a way where there are projects and call it, I don't know, call it right, where, where maybe they go and they work with an incredible animation studio who makes a whole story that becomes the Netflix show. 
And that doesn't have to take away from what then essentially is really awesome fan fiction that can still be canon, that live within the community, and, and people can still have fun and enjoy that, even while has, has has another kind of story that's the mainstream public story out there. But the reverse could also happen, right? Which is that some of these stories actually do become the thing that the Netflix show is based on, and it is actually born out of what the community has built. And and it just being another layer of ways for the community to engage and be creative and uh, and work with each other, I, I think is is really fun and exciting. Uh, I want to talk about um, the the kind of creator economy piece of this. So you mentioned ink, and I love that this is a way to reward people who are writing these stories. And my understanding is they actually, if they get a vote at all, whether it's a yes vote or a no vote, there's a reward that you you get ink with that and it's just rewarding that participation. Uh, Do you want to say a little bit on that? And then I think the other piece is this free choices, premium choices component that also has the potential to um, to allow creators to to earn off of this. Yeah. So the way we think about it is um, people who are creating stories within their community are providing a valuable service to their community because when they share their story or just by the process of creating it, they're contributing to the thinking and the excitement around the characters. Even if they never share it to Twitter, if it only gets shared within their Discord, just seeing like the next animated cool thing that somebody made is going to excite other people in the community. So at like the most basic level, um, we wanna reward people for the creation of that, for the work that they put in. And we wanna make sure the community decides what what it's worth, right? And so the community can can vote on it um, in in a way that uh, basically makes sure that the person is is rewarded for what they've done. Um, also, we think there's like this opportunity potentially for uh, these these communities to have brands and and, and experiences and, and businesses that engage the broader sort of public that may or may not be part of the community um, and we have built into this, the story game, um, the story game engine uh, that Storyverse uses this idea of being able to make choices. And it's, it's like choose your own adventure type of interactive fiction where there's a moment where the game stops and you can choose from a few different choices. And um, depending on, on which choice you pick, there may be a free choice and there may be sort of like a premium choice. And the premium choice may be locked unless you, you're willing to spend um, some amount of currency to, to use it. Um, and in the long run, like, I think we're going to try to make that a very, very accessible on-ramp such that like, you know, if, if someone doesn't have a, a, a wallet yet and, and they want to take this premium choice and they've just discovered this game on the internet somehow, they're still able to very easily get their, their, um, fiat or something else into the, the system to be able to, to get through these premium choices. And so the goal there is like, that's for mass market consumption. And so it should be as easy as possible. Uh, for for people to to say I love uh, this story and I and I want to take this premium choice and then the people that are involved in the community that helped canonize that story and helped created that story can actually start to see like real revenue um, potentially coming in from from the the things that they've created um, and so then that gets to the sort of broader piece which is like like I said, there's two parts of it. One is how does the, the community value your contribution? And then how does like the broader um, public and people out there on the internet the value? Your, yeah, the normies. How do they value your contribution? <laughs> and we're hoping that we can we can solve for both. So it's early in our thinking on that, but that's, that's our thinking on it so far. We've touched on some of this in, in the conversation even so far, but I, I want to ask you if this thing succeeds to your fullest dreams what does it look like in a year and at five years ten years like what is the what does this fully played out look like um <laughs> to be honest we're, we're designing a system that we we feel like um hopefully creates like a lot of emergent behavior and so what i learned um for a while i was working on this game at zynga called yeovil and it was the biggest virtual world in the world at the time so everyone was talking about second life but all the all the sort of uh, middle-aged women were playing 
Yoville on Facebook. It had almost 10 million <laughs> daily active users at one point, and it had item trading, and we built a virtual economy. It was making hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And Everything you did are... was just setting us up for everything in Web3. It's like I can't, I, every time – we didn't get have time to go into all of it, but like I'm reading about Zynga. I'm just like, that's the metaverse. That's an NFT. Like, you know what I mean? like that's well, – you know, it just was so, so relevant. Yeah. I, I've been selling JPEGs for a long time. Um, but, yeah. no, I – no, the thing about the, to to say what was interesting about Yoville is like what we learned was that when we decided what it should be, um, and we made something that had like really a strict view of that, it was always less interesting than making some building block that let all these players decide what it ended up becoming. And so I learned a lot from that experience. And like, I my biggest concern is that we would do something that would constrain um, what the communities are capable of. Like our real goal here is to allow for maximum amount of flexibility um because to your point earlier like there, there's so many different inf interesting directions that this can go we're just asking ourselves like how do we how do we speed it up and build a really interesting layer for people to build on and then like if we're surprised we're probably doing it right um so i know mm. i hope this doesn't sound like a non-answer but um i'm most excited about the year from now where like the the direction in which it's taken off is is not the one um, that I can imagine right now, because that means we'll build a system like that has enough value to people and is emergent enough in the way that it's flexible enough in the way they use it um, that we couldn't have predicted the the outcome. And for me, like I'm not so sure that um, thinking of like what is the pinnacle of of Web two of you know getting a, a movie on Netflix is really the goal here. It might be. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to. I don't want to write it off, but but I also. I don't want to assume that that's like what we're capable of because um, this model this opens up new opportunities happened. and that's what this I'm excited about. This is a shift about. in my thinking. Yeah, this is a shift in my thinking that I've I've had recently, which is just not being so focused on on sort of web two models of success. And some of this happened. I, I just interviewed uh, Poopy who runs or, you know, is one of the co-founders of, of Doodles and it, things he was saying just were kind of opening my mind to like all, all the ways you can be thinking about these brands that isn't just so like, when's the Netflix show, you know? And I'll, I'll say one thing, we're, we're running low on time and I have other things that I want to talk to you about. But what I love about this project is it it does spark my imagination. Like as you talk, I'm like, oh, well, this is a, an interesting place to probe. And, and so uh, as I've been diving into this project, one of the things that that I have this like vision of is like, you know, this map a la other metaverses you see with the sandbox or whatever, right? But then instead of diving in and it's whatever the Nike plot, right? I'm diving in and it's a story. And now, of course, I'm getting really crazy being like, and in 20 years, or maybe it'll be less, whatever. It's like VR, right? And I'm actually just like diving in and like walking around this actual story and watching movie or, you know, it could be other brands. I mean, Gilmore Girls is my favorite show I was watching the other day. Right now I'm, I'm in like Gilmore Girls and there some scene is playing out. Like it, as somebody who loves stories more than actually games, like a metaverse built on stories is like this really cool idea that I really hadn't thought about before. Um, I don't know. What do you think of that? Yeah. Well, What's, I, I also think how, how far are, away are we from that vision? That's what I want, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, stories are medium agnostic too, right? Like people tell stories around a campfire. That's how it started. And then we started writing them down and then we, we tell them on tweet storms and, and we tell them in video games and we tell them in, in music and through lyrics, like stories are not something that is just one medium. And so like our view on this is let's go make a medium this animated interactive story medium that's like very native to what people like experiencing on the internet, because we think that's a great way to launch this. But um, we we don't think that like these stories should just live in one way. I mean, if you're writing the canon for the, these communities and these IP that exist um, in a much broader world than just this animated world, like you should be able to to go and watch that story in more context. And if you're in um, some metaverse, some 3D VR metaverse, and like these characters exist there, why not use the same story data and the same animation data that we're, we're sort of putting in to inform what that story looks like when it's happening in front of you there too. And so back to this sort of like extensibility um, idea and like this emergent um, systems thing, I'd be very happy to see lots of community or developers in the community too come in and like build more ways to to view these stories. Like this isn't something that we um, 
want to be the only sort of, uh, we call it like a user agent. We think about them like browsers, right? Like you're, you're using our, our initial sort of user agent to view these stories in a very interesting way. It's just one format. Like those should be viewable in a lot of different places. Like these stories do not just exist in, in, in one medium. And so, um, yeah, that's definitely like something that we'll be uh, jumping into a, a lot over the next year. And um, my hope is they, they become like a layer that can be pulled in anywhere where it's useful to, to like the broader development community or anyone who's building a game and says, you know what, you're building a metaverse and walked in the room. What's the backstory for that? That maybe suddenly like you can actually pull this information from the storyverse and and these stories are playing out in other people's um, metaverses or games that they're building. So we we love the idea of composability and we're, we're definitely thinking about like, how do we how do we make sure we build something that's um, enabling that? Um, here's the thing, because I, I promised folks, I, I want to make sure we do this. But again, I, I wish we could just riff on this for, for even longer. But um, the licensing piece. So anybody who listens to the show knows I've been talking a lot about licensing. I think you joked about it when you hopped on. You're like, well, we have to talk about that. It's apparently the only thing you talk about on the show. I'm like, I know. Because I do think it's so important. And I don't think that people have thought up to this point necessarily strategically enough about what licensing means for them as holders of these assets. And you have some thoughts because licensing and rights are, are very seminal to this project because what I can do with my board ape impacts how I can use it in the story verse. You have some really interesting, thought, interesting thoughts about how to represent licensing and, and how to incorporate it into this product you're building. Tell us about yep. that. Uh, well, well we, what we noticed was that um, when we set out to build like a, a digital sort of product where you can use your your nfts in a way um, where we want to make sure that people own what they're using the next important uh question is like well how are they allowed to use that thing and that depends on the project i mean at, at the end of the day the creators of of these nfts that's written into the license agreement that we all agree to when we become a member of the project um and i unfortunately i, I think like a lot of people um don't necessarily read you know license agreements, even if they're excited about these projects. But I, I do think that everyone's been very excited about like the spirit of, of many of these projects has been about this community creation idea and that actually um, that most of the licenses do allow for uh, the type of system we're doing. But what we realized was um, none of it was was written in, in code. And so like we think that maybe part of the reason some of this hasn't happened is because if you really want to make sure you're respecting the license of every project, you need a machine readable version of, of the license for each project. Um, and so one of the things we've been thinking about is like, how do we go and take these, these license agreements and um, represent them in code and like sort of parameterize like what's okay and, and what the people who are using these assets must do or, or can't do, or um, you know, what rights they have to licensing or commercial use of, of these different projects. And so we, we uh, you know, we think that hopefully, like if, if we can contribute to like getting that data um, available, it, it, it will have a lot more use cases than just our project. Um, and we're doing it because we have to. Like we don't believe in launching this in a way where we, we don't um, at least have a basic way of, of making sure that we, that we do right by everybody um, in the community. Like the, the content and the IP that's being created is, it's, it's valuable because people have put so much work behind it. And, and we want to make sure that we, we find a way for everybody to um, decide how their, their content is used um, based on, on the system that, that we all have. And, but what's exciting about it is like, hopefully in solving that problem, it's not just the Storyverse, but it's also more projects that can then go and start to use this metadata to, to produce more interesting things. And is this a, um, I'll give a hypothetical here. Is, is, you know, in a world where there's a project that you can monetize, you have the commercial rights to it up to $50,000 or $100,000, which is very common, right? I think MeBits is that way, right? You can make up to $50,000 on this or $100,000 on it. But after that, you have to seek permission from the whatever project, et cetera. Like where this can be an automated process where if you had somebody who, I mean, it'd be incredible, right? But was making the equivalent of $50,000 in ink or in other things because they were just creating amazing stories in this story verse, where it, it could be auto set, where that'd be an automated process where it says, hey, you've hit your, it's, you've hit your limit of your $50,000 or something where it just becomes uh, much more seamless and, and less scary uh, to try and navigate what, what your rights are. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think 
I think it will empower communities because when you understand exactly where the line is, um, then you're free to go and, you know, we, we talk about blockchains are powerful because they make things permissionless and, and trustless. Mm. And um, I think with a licensing agreement um, that, that is not living in sort of like metadata that um, the computer can understand and that someone can very easily understand what's allowed and what isn't allowed, um, you, you don't necessarily have enough of confidence that you can do what you'd like to do. And so our hope is that um, by making this more clear, like all these people who are already super excited participants of these communities will go do more um, and do bigger things mm -hmm. because suddenly it'll become very clear to them and they'll have the courage to go do it um, and not worry about like interpreting, you know, the sort of more um, difficult to, to understand uh, broader legalese around one of these projects. And so, um, I think it's like we don't want to be a mediator in the sense that, you know, we don't want to represent the communities here um, at, at the owner level or at like the creator level. What we really want to do is just try to like find a way to represent it in a way that like everybody um, gets what they want. Um, and and it's really a technical requirement, actually, um, if we want to do this in a way that like is fair to everybody. And so we're just trying to design that system and like, well, it'll be an ongoing conversation for us. and and everybody else just because um, we hope that it's like an important building block of, of the ecosystem. And it's not something we um, we feel like is, you know, ours to decide on our own. We're just trying to figure out the right way to do this for everybody. Amazing. Well, I think we are probably at the point where we, we have to start wrapping. But I know a couple of things we didn't cover is sort of the business model around this. I don't think we mentioned that these are quite literally plots that you're thinking these these stories are story plots that much like Sandbox sells plots of land, these would be, you know, plots that you can use to to write your story on. I think that's an interesting component. For folks who want to like learn more or actually see how this works, practically speaking, where should they go? Yeah, our our, our website lives on uh, storyverse.xyz. Um, we have, uh, you know, Twitter accounts and Discord accounts. Definitely join our Discord. Um, this is a community-driven project. Um, it's It started by people and has grown out of a a, a company that has a lot of experience in this called Playco, um, but it, it's not. This is not a project that will be um, driven in like a Web two way. We we plan on having it be completely uh, community driven in in the long run. So, if you're interested in this, if you're you want to partner with us on this, if you want to write stories and you have um, you know basic questions about how to make a story that's interesting, or if you have a huge collection and you want to do something more ambitious, or if you're a developer and you want to figure out how how you can take these stories and pull them into other things you've been working on, or if you want to just join the team, like and 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 help us go and build this, like we're we want to meet everybody, um, and and we're really excited about just jumping in and seeing if we can't build something bigger with with all the different awesome communities that have been in this space. Amazing. Anything else you think we missed? I feel like we hit a lot of the the highlights there. No, no, I think that's great. And yeah, hopefully um, we'll have more fun things to share soon. So, um, you know, I know there's a, it was a great conversation and, um, you know, uh, I'd love to come back on at some point when we have more new things to announce. I would love that. I can throw out more of my hypothetical future visions and you can tell me how many years away they are. And we'll play that game. Um, Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Justin. I really, I would love to have you on. I mean, I would love to die. There's so many things, you know, I, I would want to know stories about Dapper and Immutable and Decentraland. We didn't even get to get to those questions around some of these other projects that you've, uh, you've advised. And so I think you have a lot to share for this space because of how long you've been in adjacent and precursor spaces, but really glad we got you on for, for this hour or so and look forward to chatting more in the future. Thanks, Carly. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. 
Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.